Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, um, my topic is uh, not exactly a very small one, um, looking at EU democracy in light of different conceptions of the EU political system. What I think is important to focus on is that the EU is a contested uh, entity, and there is a lot of contestations also, therefore, on the question of democracy. It's a very broad form of contestation because it has engendered a lot of debate over many decades. And what I want to do first is to try to spell out a bit more what this type of contestation really consists in. And then I will also say something about the crisis, the, because the crisis has also changed the debate. What we find when we look at the debate is that there's a considerable debate over the appropriate version of democracy, whether the EU really is a matter of delegation from the member states so that the EU itself doesn't figure very prominently as a carrier of uh, democratic principles and arrangements, or whether the EU can not only claim to be democratic, but can also redeem elements of that claim or whether the EU is part of a broader configuration of the world system. So, already now I have s said to you something about the two first elements, namely of the type of democracy and over the level of democracy. What is the appropriate level? Is it the nation state? Is it the European Union level? Or is it the global level? These are not exclusive levels, of course. We are talking about multi-level configurations. But of course, the first one on the national is mainly focusing on one particular level. But you see, the point about level is coming in as an important component itself in the debate. This, of course, also brings up the question of the type of political system. And we have to be careful as researchers, because there is a propensity among people to look, to look for and analyze what they want to see rather than looking sufficiently closely at what is actually there. there is Because there's a lure in the whole thinking about uh, democracy in terms of there being normative templates on what democ democracy ought to be. So we have to be careful on this too, to find out and try to measure and find out exactly what kind of system are we confronting and relate that to the normative yardsticks that we're also operating with. But my point is that the two things are in play. There is no clarity neither on what exactly should be the normative principles that is the proper template, and there's also discussion about the type of system that the European Union is. And there's also a debate, this is no less important in many ways, of the scope of the polity, and this also feeds into the other previous elements, because if the EU is mainly a system of delegation, clearly the scope of action it is undertaking is much more narrow than what it would be if it had been a self-standing and understood as an independent and an, a system itself with ability to form decisions across a whole span of, of issues. So if you think about locating democracy at the European level, then the range of issues relevant to the European Union will be much broader than if you think about it in terms of a system of delegation. And what the crisis has impressed on us is that there's also a question about the um, future of democracy in Europe. Because it is no longer clear, or necess necessarily so, that democratization will somehow catch up with integration. Be that is something we have seen earlier and, and we can also discern from other presentations. But there's no clear uh, image now anymore that this is necessarily going to be the case. And finally, I would also say that underpinning much of this debate and the question on, on the EU is the question of whether one should basically be copying familiar systems of, of democratic organizing, or whether the EU is more a case of experimentation. Even that is a, a part of the contestation, and it's also in many ways informing what we're seeing here. So what I will do now is I'll try to spell out this a bit more in a bit more detail by, by exemplifying three positions in the debate, just to s show you how these different types of forms of disagreement actually figure in the, in the specific debates, because, of course, you can discern particular positions. The most classical one, and this, uh, the one that predominated for a long time, of course, is the idea that the EU is made up of 
nation states or me member states and that they are still the holders of the key democratic principles and also hold the key levers on the European Union so that it answers to them. And of course the idea behind this model is that the EU was made to tackle problems associated with globalization and that it extends the ability to rein in global processes, international organizations, by allowing the states to, uh, to control issues over a larger territory, of course, of the European Union. But at the same time, then dealing with issues that the member states could actually control and that they could also uh, take them back, if need be, from the EU. If the EU was transgressing beyond what w would be understood as uh, uh, acceptable to the member states in terms of also preserving their democratic arrangements, would to some extent be understood as a threat, but that the member states would have the ability to take back and control the EU-level institutions. So that, that's the idea of delegation. As I said in the previous slide, that delegation was one of the elements, and of course, this is the model that most explicitly thinks about uh, democracy in terms of delegation. Now, with the crisis, the diagnosis from this angle is something you see widely. And that is, of course, that the Euro crisis is particularly problematic because it's weakening democracy at the national level. The whole point of the member states being able to rein in what happens at the European Union level has been diminished, in a sense, because of the crisis. So that's obviously... a. a a big problem. So th again, this position is not concerned about, about whether the EU is democratic, it's concerned about the democratic uh, conditions in the member states. And of course, the verdict, and you see this most explicitly among Eurosceptics, is that integration has gone too far and it's necessary to reduce or roll it back. And that raises the question of how far integration can and should be rolled back, because this is one of the thorny issues. The very process of rolling back integration can generate a lot of conflict and resentment, and nobody knows exactly at what level you can stop it and still have a viable democracy across Europe. The, the, the problem with this is, is that it can engender a very negative kind of process that can escalate, and then we could be back to anarchy. Besides, in my view, this diagnosis is not adequate because the EU has progressed beyond. That's why there is a justification for the two next positions in the debate. Of course, this is something that is contested, but I don't think there's a need to, uh, to contest um, federalism. Um, actually, there is actually a debate among federalists as to whether federalism requires democracy. I'm not going to go into this now, but there is actually a debate on that. The idea, of course, among federalists is that European integration is compatible with federalization and federal democracy. Now keep in mind that federalization and integration are not the same. Integration means to be brought together under a new system. Federalization is a more complex process of both integrating but also preserving autonomy. It's, it's a much more dualistic uh, process because it is about uh, finding a proper balance between self-rule and shared rule. Now, even with that proviso, we do see that the very diversity of the EU, both in cultural and institutional terms, is really challenging the way in which we have thought about federations, because they are differentiated, but within clear bounds between levels and so on. And of course, looking at the established federations, there's a lot of institutional uniformity at the different levels. So the EU does not have that. Therefore, it raises a number of, of these questions. Clearly, any thinking about federalism in Europe must bring in the fact that Europe consists of nation states. The treatise has accepted that as well. And we are talking about, therefore, a multinational federation. And that, that means that a central element of a system like that must be to accommodate the competing nation-building and nation-preserving projects in Europe. That's the only way of thinking about federalism in this context, and it makes it very difficult. But it, because you do have a clash between federalism and nationalism as type of, of doctrines in this. And of course, any system, as the literature on, f on multinational federalism is showing, um, must deal with the fact that this is a question of frail solidarity. Now, 
this uh, position would understand a crisis as leading to deconstitutionalization and that there is a problem now that even if you continue with integration, there's no assurance that that will actually be democratization. And of course, the whole big debate for federalists in this is the whole point about the hardcore and uh, Europe a la carte or whatever, these uh, different uh, trajectories. That's testing federalism to the very limits in some ways. So that's another established notion. And then, of course, we do see the, the last position. This is really a grab bag of different kinds of positions. I call it transnational democracy. It is, on the one hand, thinking about governance as a less hierarchical mode of, of governing, um, more voluntarism. You think about uh, open method or coordination as one of the techniques. At the same time, you also think about this as a possibly global system. Uh, some people are talking about governance without government at a global level, and this can, to some extent, be downloaded to the EU level and, and be discussed in this sense. Now, that means that it highlights the experimental element because all the positions in this, under this heading, if you want, are basing themselves on a different way of thinking about uh, democracy that's much more dependent on deliberation. It's less focused on representative democracy and more on deliberation. Now, with a crisis, I think, I think it has really raised questions about the stability and viability of transnational systems. We are seeing, for instance, governing techniques have turned into what they call hard governance, which are not legally authorized but still have sanctioning power. That's one of the problems. The other thing, of course, it's um, insofar as the EU is moving towards this less hierarchical system, it's also more vulnerable to external pressures. And, of course, if we think about EU as part of a broader system, it's very dependent on broader global developments. And, of course, also any notion of, of cosmopolitan uh, democracy must take into consideration the negative elements or the, or the de-democratization processes in places like Russia and, and China, authoritarian regimes and so forth, that are also putting clear limits on this. So what I've tried to, to show you is basically that the debate on EU democracy is broad. It has been so for quite a long time. It's a very in intellectually engaging debate because it brings up questions about our understanding of political systems, democratic principles, and we have the privilege of seeing some of these applied in principle. At the same time, there is always this danger now, <coughs> but the crisis has amplified, that the process might not be one of further democratization, but that democracy itself is at stake. Thank you.